will give his second uh, lecture on axions and cosmology. Very good. I am. Um, so let's continue with the uh, cosmology of axions. And we were left um, um, with the task of uh, evaluating the evolution of the serial modes of the axon field. The axon modes of the axon field uh, have a very exciting uh, history. And, um, but unfortunately, as I told you, the key, the key aspect to remember is that they depend on the initial conditions. So the amount of serial modes that we are going to have now are the, uh, strongly related with the amount that we have in the initial condition phase. That, as I told you, typically we expect that it will come after a phase transition, right? Because the axon is an effective degree of freedom, uh, and uh, when the um, when the energies at stake at the universe are much higher than this uh, FA, the axon decay constant, the axon is uh, does does not exist in a sense uh, as a degree of freedom. So as temperatures drop the axon suddenly becomes uh, a uh, degree of freedom can be excited. And then at some at, at that point, uh, it will have to take some vacuum expectation value and all vacuum expectation values corresponding to theta uh, between zero and two pi are equally uh, are equally good or bad. So uh, actually the, the, the axon field doesn't have any reason to choose one against the other. So the idea is that uh, a different causally disconnected part, parts of the universe, different initial conditions will be taken. And the vacuum expectation value of the action will be smooth between these patches. So the picture was looking very much like this. Um, and now we are going to see what happens with this uh, picture when inflation, uh, when a malicious field uh, that stays together with the action decides to enter in a period of inflation. And, this, uh, and then <clears throat> inflates one of these smooth patches of the universe where the accent was already smooth uh, to be bigger than the uh, universe that we live today. So um, the only force that the accent field is going to feel is uh, the force due to the QCD potential that uh, Giovanni had uh, very kindly and very nicely introduced already. And um, so in order to uh, start the evolution of the axon field as a function of the potential, the only thing we have to do is just, we take the, we can take from the action, um, the, we can cal we calculate the equations of motion for the axon field, uh, the all uh, uh, Lagrange equations, and then we, we derive the um, equations of motion for the axon field. Uh, and the, uh, these equations of motion are going to be Essentially, the equations of motion for the um, for the expectation value of the of the quantum field, uh, but I'm I'm not going to make a distinction between the classical field and the expectation value of the of the quantum field. Uh, partly because uh, it's uh, muddy, uh, muddy, very muddy territory uh, for me, and uh, because I'm not I'm not very uh, educated in this in this matter. So let me just uh, focus on the. <clears throat> On the evolution of the accent field uh, in the early universe, uh, which is uh, this equation, this is a wave equation for the accent field, right? And it has a uh, uh, couple of particularities. Uh, one of them is that uh, it has a friction. Uh, it has a friction term for the accent field that is proportional to the expansion rate of the universe. Um, that uh, the Laplacian here is divided by the scale factor, and this is because this Laplacian is taken with respect to the moving coordinates and not to physical coordinates. And then here uh, we have the derivative of the QCD potential, which is the only potential in principle that acts on the axion uh, with respect to the axion field. <clears throat> uh, as a reminder, because I think yeah, uh, Giovanni didn't show, um, uh, only schematically show this. Uh, let me just tell you that this potential uh, is proportional to the uh, well, at least the second derivative of this potential is the is what Giovanni called the topological susceptibility. So this is a purely um, QCD uh, quantity, uh, and uh, this is what exactly uh, is equal to the mass of the accent squared multiplied by uh, the accent decay constant. And this quantity can, can be calculated as Giovanni very nicely did at zero temperature, right? Using uh, chiral uh, chiral Lagrangians. Actually, you can calculate the full potential at leading order in chiral perturbation theory, uh, but also at high and 
as uh, he uh, very nicely explained as well, at very high temperatures, you can also calculate uh, the topological susceptibility using the dilute, the, uh, dilute instant tone gas approximation. This gives you this, uh, this blue line here. And this gives you more or less the typical behavior of um, the size of the potential. Um, <clears throat> is uh, of the order of the QCD of lambda QCD to the four at very, zero temp uh, very small temperatures and then decreases <clears throat> super fast like uh, T to the eight or so uh, at much higher temperatures. Uh, so here you also, uh, you can see some of the uh, lattice results um, of several groups that well, more or less agree with uh, the losing stanton except for normalization and some, uh, some slope. And there's a, oh, there's a lot of uh, interesting things to be said about this, um, but I'm not, I'm not going to say uh, so. Uh, what I'm, <clears throat> I, I just wanted to show you, of course, these results. And I wanted to show you, uh, to, to tell you that I'm going to choose a, a simplified, I'm going to, for this discussion, use a simplified version of the QCD potential, uh, which is going to be in principle, uh, which is highly motivated at very high temperatures because this is what comes from the diluted uh, instant on gas, the minus cosine that also um, Giovanni mentioned. And this uh, uh, with a height uh, proportional to um, the topological susceptibility. And actually this is the most important. So this high temperature is the most important uh, time for evaluating this potential. So uh, in principle, this is justified because all the most of the interesting action is going to happen around here. Very good. So <clears throat> with this potential, I can uh, take the derivative and I can, so the derivative of the cosine is sine. Absolutely. Wow. Then you have to ask jo uh, Giovanni, but uh, it's very simple to answer. So this, um, so the, the lattice calculation uh, is at high temp so at high temperature is extremely difficult to produce instantons in the lattice, um, and um, so one has to one has to uh, use some techniques uh, to sample distribution probability, uh, and one has to do some very very strong extrapolation, very very hard extrapolation, right? So depending on how you do this extrapolation, you can get uh, this, uh, or if you so what we, what what we did in uh, with um, in our calculation with Borsan et al. So we did an educated extrapolation where we assumed the, the behavior of the extrapolation. And then we get, the, we get what we think is the right result with a very strong assumption for the function that extrapolates. Uh, but if you do, don't do this assumption, you can, get very, you can get something very different. I don't know whether Giovanni wants to add something to it. With this uh, this result, hmm. very good. So now the the equation that we have to uh, use for the zero mode is just very simple. We just put the cosine uh, as a potential, and then we neglect the the gradients because I'm talking about the zero mode. Um, and now we have <clears throat> this equation. This is a damped harmonic oscillator with the particularity that the damping uh, is decreasing in time. With the, because the scale, this expansion of the universe is, uh, is decreasing in time. And uh, the action mass is actually at the beginning increasing in time because uh, as the universe expands, the temperature drops and therefore the action mass or the topological susceptibility is increasing. And here you have uh, the behavior where N, remember is something like eight or something like this. Uh, so the if one over T goes, so the, the mass goes like one over, n divided by two and t, uh, sorry, the yeah temperature decreases with the scale factor one over r. So then the mass is increasing with the scale factor on n halves and uh, during radiation domination, uh, the scale factor decreases, uh, well, increases as um, the square root of, of time. So then you get that uh, expansion of the universe is decreasing and the action mass is increasing with time. So we have these two quantities <clears throat> and, the, and the typical behavior of the solution of the evolution is, is uh, like this. 
So if you start with um, any, well, not any, but if you start with some initial value for, for theta, uh, value in one part of the universe, then this at the beginning, <clears throat> dumping is much more important than, than the driving frequency. Frequency, So the theta will stay constant, but when the, uh, the driving frequency becomes of the order of the dumping, uh, then it will drive the, the axon field to start oscillating. And uh, but these oscillations due mostly to the axon mass are now being dumped uh, still by the expansion of the universe. And that's why you see that the amplitude of the oscillations is also dumped with time. Um, I can say well, a little bit more about this. So in the uh, overdump regime, actually you can, you can solve this equation very easily by just neglecting the driving force of the oscillator. Uh, and then you get this equation has uh, two solutions. The first one is trivial. Um, that, uh, sorry, it's trivial, but I wrote, wrote it wrong. Uh, is uh, sorry, it's theta equals uh, constant, right? Because for any theta, any constant theta, uh, the time derivative will be zero and the second derivative will be also zero. So this equation will be satisfied. And the second equation, uh, for, to get the second equation, you only have to realize that this equation can be, can be converted into uh, the time derivative of this quantity. Um, of the derivative with respect to time multiplied by scale factor cube. And then you get, um, so this, this quantity inside the parentheses has to be a constant. And so this is the second equation that tells you that if you put some uh, initial condition that has a derivative, so if, if you, if you mm, start your, your action with some velocity, if the action is moving, then this velocity of the action uh, will decay as one over R cube. So very soon, it will go to a constant, okay? So that's the idea. That's why I started here in this plot without a velocity, but I could have, very good. Uh, then we have the underdumped uh, region in which, uh, <laughs> I didn't have enough care with these uh, slides, apparently. Uh, the mass is much greater than H, okay? So supposed to be the opposite regime to this, <laughs> not the same. Uh, so in this underdamp region, uh, the most important term in, this in the equation of oscillations is the action mass. Uh, and then we can do a WKB approximation, <clears throat> which we force the solution to be the exponential of uh, essentially the frequency. But if, since the frequency is changing in time, we have to uh, write the, the integral of the, of the frequency in time. And, uh, and when we impose this, we can solve for a slowly varying amplitude in the equation and the slowly varying amplitude turns out to be one over ma r cube square root. So this solves the equation at the first uh, non-trivial order in the WKV approximation is, and is extremely relevant. So this form in this amplitude uh, because it tells us that it is uh, the axion, what we would call the axon number that is conserved in this, in this regime, as we will see now. Um, and this shows also that the critical time is precisely when the action mass is of the order of Hubble. And since these two functions depend on time, one has to solve, in order to know this critical time, one has to solve an equation. Remember that in radiation domination, the Hubble expansion rate goes like the temperature squared divided by Planck mass with some degrees of freedom, while uh, the action mass would go to the, with the square root of the topological susceptibility and then uh, lambda QCD divided by T1 to the n halves. So there's a missing square here. But you can solve this equation very easily, and then you get <clears throat> that the temperature at which that the temperature that the universe will have when the action starts to oscillate is given by this expression parametrically. And it has um, this funny dependence on lambda QCD uh, and so on. With uh, yeah, exactly. If you <clears throat> if you Instead of doing this analytically, you just solve the equations using the numerical results for the topological susceptibility. You get these numbers um, that tell you that T1 <clears throat> for, for an axial mass today, no, so the axial mass here uh, of 50 micro electron volt, which is typical for this, for the axon uh, cold dark matter, the, <clears throat> the temperature at which the action starts to oscillate is something like 1.6 giga electron volt. 
as I promised, most of the action, uh, of the, uh, most of the fun happens here, all the fun starts here, at, in, the, in the high temperature regime of the solution. And it's also interesting to mention that uh, uh, the expansion rate of the universe at that time, <clears throat> and this is related with the size of the horizon, is of the order of one nano electron volt. Okay, the expansion rate is one nano electron volt in, um, in units of energy. If you do the, the inverse of one nano electron volt, you get something like one kilometer or something like this. So the, the horizon of the universe at this time is of the order of one kilometer. And um, one can also calculate the redshift at which this happens, uh, and one gets something like 10 to the 13. So um, the universe expands by a factor of 13 from the moment the action starts oscillating until now. And one can also um, take this horizon size, so that the causal horizon when the action starts to oscillate uh, and uh, expand it until today, right? And so. Uh, so this kilometer that was at, uh, at a redshift of 10 to the 13, it is now 10 to the 13 kilometers, right? Which is uh, of the order of 10 to the 70 centimeters and is uh, of the order of a few milliparsec, okay? So that's the size of the universe when the accent started to oscillate. This is very, it's, it's important to have this in mind for what comes uh, next. Um, yeah, so, so this, this is the time scale actually uh, as long as uh, theta, the initial value of theta, is not is is not fine tuned to uh, theta equals pi, because if theta is equal pi, then of course the acceleration that the action feels is zero. If it's at the top of a, of the potential, it will not move. And I have assumed here that the acceleration is uh, the action mass. So if the if you are very close to to the maximum, then you have to replace uh, the acceleration by the sine of theta initial divided by theta, uh, and this goes to zero. So the time scales actually become uh, longer by this factor. And it actually, they, they go to, the time scales, they go to infinity if theta is equal to, if, uh, if theta is equal to pi. Yeah. At the quantum level, this is not true because you cannot fix the accent field to be exactly pi. So then the quantum fluctuations, which are typically irrelevant, uh, they will become extremely important, maximally important to drive the accent field to zero. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the prediction, well, we, we, have, we will see it in the, in the next slides. Uh, very good point. Um, so the energy density or in the accent field is given by the well, energy momentum tensor. And uh, for uh, zero mode, the energy momentum tensor is that of, of a perfect fluid, uh, zero component energy density and uh, spatial components equal to the pressure. And one can calculate from the, from the Lagrangian, what is the value of the energy density uh, and what is the value of the pressure. In the case of a zero mode, forget about these uh, uh, Laplacians here. And what you get is the typical energy and pressure for a scalar field that you also you might be acquainted for in the, for the case of inflation. And what you get is that when the kinetic energy is very small, of the, when the time derivative of the action field is very small, only the potential matters. And then what you get is the P divided by rho is equal to minus one. And this is the equation of state of a cosmological constant or vacuum energy. And when the, when the action starts to oscillate, then uh, we have a harmonic oscillator in which the energy uh, oscillates between the kinetic and the potential, right? In such a way that rho goes to a constant, but P uh, oscillates between uh, zero and two. Um, so the equation of state goes from uh, minus one to an oscillating function around zero uh, that is equivalent essentially to equation state equals zero. Uh, once you once you integrate this over the expansion rate of the universe, and so we so the the fluid of the accent called uh, of the accent field behaves like a cosmological constant at very early times, and effectively it behaves as a fluid with equation state equals to zero, 
uh, once uh, the accent starts to oscillate. And this, this is exactly the uh, equation of state of uh, cold dark matter. <clears throat> Just wanted to mention that here, now that we know how, what the energy density is for the oscillating axion, it's the kinetic part times the potential part, one can calculate the energy density here uh, from the solution, the WV solution, and what gets that the energy density is, of course, the frequency of the oscillator squared multiplied by the amplitude. And if I put the amplitude that I found in the solution, uh, remember that the amplitude was one over square root of MA multiplied by R cubed, and then a phase. So when I calculate the square, uh, Theta squared is one over MA R squared. And uh, I get uh, precisely uh, that the, the energy behaves as, uh, one second, the energy <clears throat> scales with the mass of a quantum and divided by the volume of the universe that expands. This is exactly how a dust how a gas of particle, non-relativistic particles will scale. If you put a lot of non-relativistic particles in a volume, and then you expand this volume, uh, so each of these particles has a mass, right? Now this mass can change. If, if, you, if you accept that this mass can change, uh, the energy will be equal to the mass, but then the volume has expanded. So the density should decrease as one over the volume uh, and therefore one over R cubed. So this tells you that the number of axions is actually being conserved by this equation. The number of axions being, if you want to find as rho, um, rho divided by MA. Yep. Yep, good. Yeah. That's a confusion. So I'm. Uh, so this is the equation of state of of the axion field, but this is immersed in in a bath of radiation, which is much much larger in density than it. So exactly, yeah. However, you can now now, now that you know this, you can actually. So this is quite generic for an axial like particle, and, and you can put this equation of state uh, at any moment in, in cosmological history. So you can, for instance, get inflation with an axion like particle, right? That then starts to oscillate and then reheats the universe. Or you could have an axion like particle that today is in this region and uh, treat the axion field like a quintessence field that is responsible for the uh, cosmological constant of the universe. This will not be the QCD axion, but, uh, but what we have learned here applies to all these cases. Very good. Um, so how do we calculate the energy density today? It's very simple and very strongly related to the calculation that we did for thermal action dark matter. So essentially the density in axions, the dark matter density today will be the density when the axions started to oscillate multiplied by the uh, dilution factor that the universe has imposed onto the, onto the fluid. And uh, if you don't take into account the, 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 the action mass is increasing, uh, you can very simply you can calculate this uh, dilution factor very, uh, very easily uh, by using the same uh, argument that we used for thermal, um, for um, for the thermal component. <clears throat> the expansion of the universe is inversely proportional to the expansion of the temperature or the, the the cooling of the temperature, and now the this temperature T1 is defined in such a way that in radiation uh, radiation domination universe. Uh, H1 is equal to MA, but we have said that H, H1 is T1 squared divided by MA uh, and Planck. So this relates my uh, T1 to H1 or MA in, in this very simple way. So then now you follow this logic and then you find out that this dilution factor is one over MA to the minus three halves. <clears throat> and so you get that uh, the the dark matter density is inversely proportional to the axial mass, typically, right? Because this is a QCD, this is a QCD quantity, is 100 GeV cube or 75 MeV uh, to the fourth power, and you you arrive to this very nice, uh, this very exciting um, conclusion that 
the smallest the axon mass is, the more dark matter you will have at the end. And this comes from the fact that uh, what I am assuming here is that the, the axon field is going to take QCD energy, energy density equal to the topological susceptibility, right? And now <clears throat> it's going to dilute it by starting to oscillate. Uh, so the energy density is constant, is the QCD and is the QCD energy density. And only when the axon starts to oscillate, it will start decreasing as one over R to the, to the cube because of the expansion of the universe. So now if the axon mass is smaller, this dilution starts later. And therefore, if you look at today, you will have still more energy density, right? So that's the trick. The idea is that axons which are lighter start the dilution of the QCD energy later, and therefore you have more energy today. And this, this, you, can, this, this you can understand very easily in, in a, two lines in the blackboard, but if you, if you take into account that the topological susceptibility, so the QCD energy is increasing in time, you can calculate, you can get the same result or the same conclusion that again, <clears throat> the energy density in axions increases with decreasing mass, uh, although the, the power is slightly different because the axon mass is changing in time. So this do, you can do as an example. Um, very good. So now, uh, essentially, we can calculate, uh, of course, we can calculate directly with equations of motion. This is the, schema this is the schematic equation uh, or the schematic result. It tells you that the dark matter density, if theta is small, will be proportional to theta squared. Uh, and, uh, and then, <laughs> This is the, the uh, there's a very strong dependence on the initial conditions on the dark matter abundance today. But this means that in this pre inflationary scenario, I can have the, essentially the right amount of dark matter that we observe today for any value of the axial mass by just assuming that the initial condition was adequate. Okay. Now, what is this adequate initial condition is given by this plot. Uh, uh, as a function of the mass of the action, if the mass of the action is very small this produces so much energy, it's so efficient in producing energy that you need to invoke a very small initial condition to have axon dark matter, giving you the, the observed uh, dark matter abundance of the order of, <clears throat> if you go to the 10 to the minus 12, that corresponds to FA of the order of uh, the um, Planck scale. The so the, the fine tuning in the initial conditions is of the order of 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four. Is much better than the 10 to the minus uh, one fine tuning of, uh, of the standard model, uh, but still is a relatively small fine tuning. Now, if uh, you insist in having action dark matter in this pre inflationary scenario for very large values of MA, for which the uh, action dark matter is, is very strongly diluted, and so you don't get a lot of them, then you have to fine tune the initial angle to pi. Right, because of course, if you put the initial angle to pi uh, to very close to pi, you can keep the QCD energy for uh, infinite amount of time in the absence of quantum corrections, and then uh, make it so delay the oscillations as much as you want. This only happens uh, if uh, the quantum the quantum fluctuations uh, are small. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So if you if theta is smaller than this, you underproduce. If theta is small, is larger than this, you overproduce the amount of dark matter. So you see it here is very it's very likely to overproduce dark matter. And uh, but also you you can you can get very interesting uh, conclusions from this plot. For instance, here the typical overproduction of dark matter it would be of ten to the ten to the eight, which is the square of uh, of theta, right? For instance. So it's not 10 to the 50, it's 10 to the 8 only. The, the red and the blue line. I have not, I have not talked about the, the red line yet. But the red line is... Um, <clears throat> but I can tell you, the red line <clears throat> uh, is the... 
if I take an average over all uh, uh, values of theta, right, um, weighted by, by a, a probability that tells you that it's equally probable to have all values, right? So this is equivalent. So if I do an average over theta, this is equivalent to this value of theta, which is 2.14 or something like this, okay? This is the only thing. Um, and this is typically the useful for a post-inflationary scenario that comes later. But it's not very relevant for what I'm going to say. Now, one might, um, so there's a very strong theoretical bias in this scenario or for the axiom to, to have uh, decay constants that are related to the GAT scale or the string scale or to the Planck scale, um, at least from the, from the theorist, right? And when you see this, this is not good uh, because axiom, uh, axioms with the, uh, decay constants of, of the most desirable range, they overproduce dark matter very easily, right? Uh, however, there might be uh, nice anthropic arguments that tell you that um, in this scenario, uh, we might, so the intelligent life might only be able to form in regions of the universe where theta was very small. If theta was very, was very large, uh, there's a lot of dark, more than, much more than dark matter than baryonic matter, uh, and the uh, evolution of the, of the universe changes uh, significantly, right? The, in particular, the galaxies uh, will form much earlier, and the universe might be too hot uh, to, form, um, to, to form intelligent life. So there's a lot of selection biases that we have been studied by Tech Mark and uh, et al. That, put, and that tells you that typically uh, you can have naturally um, action dark matter in this anthropic uh, window, which would be the for very small values of theta. Uh, but this is uh, this is speculation. I just wanted to say, uh, I just wanted to mention this very briefly. Um, so what happens in this scenario? This scenario is, is very easy, but it doesn't. Uh, it's, it's not very predictive, right? But it has one very interesting and very strong prediction. That is that the axiom. Uh, is a degree of is a propagating degree of freedom during inflation, right? So this is the prediction. This is what has allowed us to make the accent field smooth. Uh, but uh, in this case, the accent field is a, is a massless degree of freedom, typically during inflation. And uh, what happens with massless degrees of freedom during inflation is that the quantum fluctuations uh, become class become uh, so grow and become classical, and they get imprinted in the universe as uh, fluctuations of the accent field at large scales, okay? So the quantum fluctuations become classical at large scales. Uh, so we cannot take the accent field to be a universal constant. There will be fluctuations. And these fluctuations are going to be fluctuations of the dark matter if the axons become the dark matter of the universe, right? Now, in this case, we, we will have two sources of fluctuations in the universe. The inflaton that drove the expansion when, when the inflaton drives inflation, it suffers fluctuations, and these fluctuations get imprinted on the radiation when the, when the inflaton rehits the universe. But now we are saying that the accent field is also present during inflation, and it also fluctuates, has its own quantum fluctuations, and these fluctuations are independent. Now, later on, the accent field becomes the dark matter of the universe and has fluctuations which do not coincide with the adiabatic fluctuations of the temperature of the inflaton, okay? So this scenario predicts that the dark matter has fluctuations which are not adiabatic, which, has, which are of isocurvature type. Now you go to the CMB and you uh, study what type of fluctuations we have in the, uh, in the different fluids. Uh, and you can actually make an analysis to a combination of adiabatic plus isocurvature fluctuations. So another component of uh, fluctuations, which is not aligned to the fluctuations of the temperature. <clears throat> and this isocurvature co component has a, a multiple expansion, which is very different from the adiabatic uh, component, right? In particular, you see that it has a lot of power at, at low frequencies. So it's relatively easy to identify that in an analysis. Now, uh, Planck or WMAP or any study of uh, an of the CMB has never found an exocurvature component. So we can put very strong limits on such a component of the order of uh, 10 to the minus 10. 
or let's say something like uh, four percent of the scalar spectrum of adiabatic fluctuations. Uh, we can very easily calculate the the power in adiabatic sorry in so curvature fluctuations of the axon field. These are uh, in order to do this, we only have to calculate the fluctuations of, of axions. Fluctuations of axions are fluctuations of the axion field. The axion field is massless, so the fluctuations during inflation have a power which is essentially the expansion rate of, of inflation divided by pi squared. And uh, because this has to be normalized with the total amplitude or total number of axions, we have the amplitude of the axion field during inflation that can be fixed to be the initial condition of the axon that gives us the, the dark matter of the universe. So if this is uh, has to be smaller than a quantity, then we can use this expression to put a constraint on uh, the Hubble constant during inflation as a function of FA. And uh, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is what you have here as a function of well, FA or MA. Uh, the and um, yeah, this is the, the maximum value of um, of the um, isocurvature or, or, or the power in isocurvature fluctuations that the observations allow for different values of the amount of dark of axon dark matter. Of course, if axons are the hundred hundred percent of the dark matter of the universe, then you have one prediction, which is this uh, line over here. <laughs> Essentially, the Hubble scattering inflation has to be really very small, 10 to the 6 GeV or below in this very small range that I'm showing here. Uh, but if you allow the accents to be on something like 1%, you can relax this constraint very much and you can consider periods of inflation with larger values of, uh, of the expansion rate. Okay. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, but this is another, another type of presenting the same results. Uh, you have here the uh, Hubble scale of inflation, and here you have the the, uh, the value of FA uh, and the axial mass, and then you can you can see that always if you go to very small values of H1, you can escape these isocurvature constraints that depend on the amount of, of the ratio of axial dark matter to the total amount of dark matter. Uh, and um, why, why is why I'm telling you that this is very exciting? Well, uh, it's exciting because uh, in principle, we can measure the value of the expansion rate during inflation if we measure gravitational waves from inflation, from inflation. Because the graviton is a massless field during inflation. It also has uh, its own quantum fluctuations and they have the same size than, uh, they have the same size than I, I showed you before. H1 squared divided by the typical amplitude, well, in this case is the Planck mass, which is the FA, FA of the gravitons, right? Uh, so we have this uh, prediction. And then if we measure this, we will immediately know the value of the energy scale of inflation. Now, the sensitivity of the next generation of experiments that could, that could measure gravitational waves from inflation uh, is not very good. It's only uh, 10 to the 14 GeV. We cannot go to much lower values. But this means that if we measure this, we will measure 10 to the 14 GeV. And you look at this, at this plot, 10 to the 14 is here. So we would exclude completely this scenario, even if uh, the, dark the uh, amount of action dark matter is extremely small, okay? So if we, fi if we find gravitational waves, we might kill this post-inflationary scenario very strongly. It comes from... So I, th I think this was the sensitivity for, um, for light bird. Light bird failed, but... Uh, but... Mm, yeah. So uh, next generation uh, CMB polarization can can will have this this. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, this is assuming slow roll inflation, a generic slow slow roll inflation. But this is strongly dependent on, on the axiom model 
and uh, it, it can also depend on the on the action uh, so on the inflationary model uh, and I can show you a couple of examples in which one can avoid this thing. For instance, if the Saxian field, so the radial, so we have seen some examples of, of axial models, and uh, sometimes sometimes the axial field is, is the angular degree of freedom of a of a real scalar, right, of a complex scalar. Now, if this complex scalar, or the radial mode, is the inflaton, uh, it might have a very large vacuum expectation value during inflation, but and then. Uh, after inflation, it can roll down to its back to, to its uh, zero temperature vacuum expectation value, right? And in this case, which was pointed about, pointed out by Fairbairn, uh, David Marshall, so you would have flat, fluctuations when you have a very large web. Uh, there are fluctuations in the action field, <clears throat> and they in this in this field space they always have the size of H one, right? But uh, in theta. Which is what matters at the end. Uh, the farther away you go from the center, the the fluctuations in theta becomes smaller and smaller, right? Uh, and so this is a way to uh, decreasing the fluctuations in in the in the action field uh, that can be can be used to, for instance, avoid this bound. And there are other other ways of of uh, using this, but uh, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a lot of time, so I have to cut short this part uh, of the of the talk. And I will not tell you about the stochastic action scenario, and I will not tell you very much about this kinetic misalignment scenario, uh, except for just flashing. But this is another way uh, of getting the of getting action dark matter, in which I'm going to make the initial conditions of the action field to have such a huge initial velocity that the action field uh, is rolling around the potential, the QCD potential. Uh, even at times equal to T1, the, the traditional time at which the axon would start oscillating, the axon field started with such a huge velocity that the axon field continues to roll around 2 pi, and only at a very late time that we call time trapping, the axon field real, uh, realizes that this is inside of the QC potential and starts to oscillate around zero. But since this happens much later than T1, we have kept the uh, QCD action energy for a longer time than natural. And therefore, in this scenario, we can have more dark matter than uh, for, for the same value of MA, uh, FA than in this scenario, in the normal misalignment scenario. So this is a very interesting scenario for getting more dark matter at a given value of, of the action mass. And therefore, will help axions of largest, larger masses to give all the dark matter of the universe. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and this I'm, I, I, I don't have a I don't have a particularly well motivated uh, model in which uh, I, I could defend this very strongly, but we can discuss about it later. So there there are uh, models, and they are not uh, horrible. Yeah, we have some experts in the audience. Uh, very good. So this <laughs> so this was supposed to, to be the end of the lecture of yesterday. So let's see how this goes. <laughs> um, so we still have three quarters of an hour to tell you about the other um, um, typical action uh, scenario, which is the so-called post-inflationary scenario, which is a lot of fun as well. So so far, I've I've uh, covered half of the <laughs> half of the topic, and I've decided that action stars are not going to be covered. So I I, I still have to tell you about the post-inflationary scenario, cosmic strings and walls, and action mini clusters. Let's see how far it goes. So remember, this post-inflationary scenario is the scenario in which uh, the phase transition happens after inflation. So inflation doesn't smooth anything. So we have to deal now with a universe in which. Uh, uh, the causal horizon scale, the action is homogeneous, and, and that's it. So that this scenario is very exciting uh, in principle because we will not have any uncertainty on initial conditions because we have our universe contains many of these patches that were homogeneous. So on average, we have all the initial conditions in the universe, and if we can do this average, we will average over all initial conditions and we will have no uncertainty on, on about it. What is the problem? Uh, the problem is that, 
Well, um, the problem is that this uh, the production of this uh, in this when, when we populate the, about the accent values randomly, we are going to create a network of topological defects, and we have problems in understanding how these topological defects uh, produce dark matter axioms. Very good. And uh, something very interesting of this scenario is that naturally we predict that the dark matter is going to be inhomogeneous at small scales. No? You, you have to imagine that the universe that we have today is a collection of many universes that started with different initial conditions. Now, some of these small patches had a value close to theta equals pi and some others close to zero. So the ones where theta was close to zero the oscillations of the axon field will be very close to zero, will be not a lot of dark matter. But those who were close to pi, uh, they will have a lot of dark matter, right? So dark matter, the prediction is that in this scenario, dark matter distribution will be homogeneous on large scales. But if you go to very small scale, which is going to be this L1, uh, you will have inhomogeneities. And out of these inhomogeneities, we will have uh, dark matter halos, which are very small, which are called accent mini clusters. Uh, so this is the outline of this post-inflationary uh, scenario. So we have inflation, then we have uh, the Pacheco phase transition at around, we don't know. Then we have a, a, a huge period of uh, scaling, which topological defects produce or not produce some axioms. And then at a redshift 10 to the 13, more or less, is when the axion would start oscillating around the minimum of its potential, uh, some funny things happen here, and these uh, topological defects are supposed to be destroyed and leave us with a universe which is uh, made out only of axioms, uh, but is inhomogeneous. And um, so this axon distribution will be non-relativistic axioms, and these uh, axioms will free stream uh, very slowly until uh, more or less the redshift of matter radiation equality when uh, the fluctuations in the dark matter distribution can affect or can be effectively uh, can begin the gravitational collapse effectively, right? Uh, and uh, since the inhomogeneities are of order one, these inhomogeneities will collapse almost Im immediately and will form uh, dark matter halos already at the redshift of matter radiation equality. And these dark matter halos will. Uh, uh, slowly form halos of halos, more and bigger and bigger, until they form uh, finally the galaxies that we have now. So we will have again, like in the standard cold dark matter, a bottom up um, formation of structures. But in this case, the first structures are very small and they are born already a matter radiation equality. We will see that. Um, very good. <clears throat> so how do we calculate the dark matter abundance in this case? Well, we could say that this course, this uh, we can estimate at least the, what, would, what would be the misalignment contribution uh, from the expression that I gave you before, where I, I'm taking into account now that the accent mass uh, is different when the accent starts to oscillate uh, before. And this expression, at least when theta is small, uh, is proportional to theta squared. So I could say, if now I, my universe is filled with patches where the value of theta is different, so I could just take an aver average over theta. And I, I can even take into account in uh, our harmonicities. So the probability that the action field starts uh, equals to pi is zero. So that I can integrate over the distribution and, and the average value is finite. And is this 2.14 that uh, you were asking before in this, in this plot. So this value is something like 2.14 squared. And this is, uh, yeah, this is the typical prediction of the average misalignment scenario in this case. However, um, oh, this, is, this is new. Um, however, if you look at the initial conditions that I draw, most of the energy in the action field is not in this, um, in the zero modes, but uh, most of the energy in the action field is actually in the gradients <coughs> Of, uh, of the boundary regions between uh, these patches. Uh, what happens is that at the particular phase transition, uh, when, I've given, when I've been giving uh, random values to the axon field, 
I've, uh, I'm going to create uh, a network of uh, global cosmic strings. What is, uh, so this was uh, as, uh, from the Kivel mechanism uh, proposed in the eighties. So the idea, well, what is a cosmic string? Well, a global uh, string here is a one dimensional uh, region that goes off from the, from the screen that is topologically forced uh, to uh, take all values of theta at the same time. So you can imagine that uh, in, when, when I distribute the values of theta, I'm going to give here uh, the, the, the value of pi halves, here zero, here minus pi halves, and here pi, okay? And this forms like a loop in which I'm going around to pi. Uh, when I move in this, in this part of the universe, move around here, I move in field space around, um, around my complex scalar field, for instance. Then by continuity, there has to be a point in which the theta has to take all the values. Uh, so I cannot make this field, I cannot complete this field uh, having uh, um, no singularity. So, um, so formally, just because of, so I've, I've defined my boundary conditions to wrap two pi around this point, I am forcing this, uh, this point to exist, uh, a point that would have infinite energy. However, in practice, of course, this is going to be regulated by the ultraviolet completion of the action field. And I'm give, uh, so we have to care now. And we are going to have in this scenario, ultraviolet physics uh, at infrared scales. So at, at very late, late times in the history of the universe. So I have to do some uh, ultraviolet completion uh, to show you the main effects. And the simplest one is to use a KSVC type model in which I have my complex scalar field uh, to have a radial part. And then the action field is the, is the face of this complex scalar. In this a very simple example introduced by Andreas, the vacuum expectation value of the radial mode, which is the R here, is, uh, the value of, is the same value of FA, is the action decay constant. And uh, this particle here, excitation of the radial mode has a mass that is related with the action decay constant, but it's not exactly the action decay constant. It's proportional to this quartic coupling of the Mexican hat or the wine bottle. So what happens in this, <clears throat> in this, uh, in this model that uh, you know all very well uh, is that um, now let's look for these global string solutions. I just force the accent field or the complex scalar field to have uh, a dependence in cylindrical coordinates uh, that my theta, my theta field is going to wrap from zero to two pi. Okay, so I force uh, my action field to, to have this de de theta dependence. And then I ask for the solution of the radial component and I, have, I can solve this uh, differential equation. And what I find is that uh, the radial component uh, at infinity will take the vacuum expectation value, but when very close to zero, the radial component is going to zero. Okay, so, so the, the complex scalar field is shrinking his modulus to zero, climbing the, the Mexican hat potential in order to avoid uh, having infinite uh, gradient energy in the action field, right? And this is what happens here. So there's a, a region around the core of the string where the uh, ultraviolet, so where the, the, um, the scalar field that breaks the spontaneous symmetry breaking of, of um, the particular symmetry is not allowed to go to the, to the bed. So it has to be, it will be kept at the maximum of the, of the uh, Mexican hat. So in the core of these strings, the spont so the symmetry, the symmetry is not spontaneously broken. Okay, it's restored. One can calculate the energy uh, of these strings per unit length, uh, and one gets um, finite contributions from the radial mode. But when one integrates the 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 gradient of the accent field one finds that there's a logarithmic divergence uh, from, the, from the large scale. So if, if I integrate my energy density until a distance L, I get log of L. Uh, so here I get log of the mass, well, let's say I, I, I calculate, uh, sorry, I integrate the energy density in gradients of the action field and I get this uh, log piece and that this Will, will have to be regulated by the presence of an extra string or some on the other boundary condition. And this is due to, the, to this uh, yeah, dependence uh, of, of the gradients. 
So um, the energy density per unit length is logarithmically divergent and is regulated in the, in the core by the Saxian mass or by the radial mode mass. Now, what happens with these uh, strings? When I, when I have my phase transition, uh, I form um, these uh, strings. And uh, because there's no way in which this string can end, I have not defined a, a kind of monopole for this for these objects. These strings they have to form uh, loops, closed loops. Um, these loops can be accidentally very large, and they typically have oh, one one produces loops of all sizes after a phase transition. Uh, and uh, what are these loops going to do? Well. <clears throat> This, these regions have a huge energy density, right? So the energy density of the, of the string is of the order of uh, Fa squared. Apart from a logarithmic divergence, the energy per unit length is Fa squared. So they have a huge amount of energy and uh, the, the evolution of this network of strings is going to be in the, is going to go in the direction of minimizing this energy, right? Uh, now, how does it work? So if you have a loop, you can, you are going to, so that the, the force is going to be in the direction of shrinking this loop, okay? And if you have a, 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 a region that has some oscillations, then these oscillations are going to be, I'm going to tend to be straightened. And if you have uh, two strings which are very long and they're moving to each other, they will attract, or they can attract each other and intercept to be able to, uh, to decrease its length even more, right? So this is what we are going to see in this, in this network. So you have here, uh, Yep. So I've, I have not, I have not done this calculation, but, uh, but, the, but the, um, the, there were studies. Yeah, but this is a this is like a random walk of of the of the zero mode of the of the field, and so this has been this has been studied uh, numerically. At least I remember some some papers by Bilenking and and company that studied these things, and uh, and they found uh, loops of all sizes within the simul. Well, actually, you yeah you can uh, so of course after some time, uh, but. Even during the phase transition, you can always find the places which are which are going to lead to uh, strings topologically, because they are, so even before the phase transition, the places where the strings are are the places where the modulus of the scalar field goes to zero and wrap and 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 theta wraps to pi. So you can define strings before they have material uh, reality, uh, and you can see how above the phase transition loops are created and destroyed because they don't have this energy density before. Uh, they are created and destroyed, and uh, and and uh, these these huge loops they can be uh, they are produced also by reconnecting uh, loops. So this is uh, it's a stochastic process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but it is not like this. Um, so at high. Mm 
<laughs> this is this we have done uh, in our in our simulations all the time, right? So if you just start with random initial conditions, you you study the distribution of, of lengths of the strings and you get uh, all sizes. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, hmm, okay. Um, so, so, so the dynamics of these strings, once they have some entity, uh, just uh, essentially try to, to decrease the string length uh, uh, as fast as possible. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the resulting energy density is going to go into red shifting of gradients, uh, is going to go into uh, gravitational waves, and is going to be uh, radiated in form of axon waves because axons are coupled to, sorry, uh, strings are coupled to the axons. Uh, or they are in, in the gradients of the axon field. So they have these three channels. <clears throat> and in particular, they can produce axon waves, which are not, which is nothing but axons. So they are going to contribute uh, to the formation of uh, axons. Um, now, these strings, they can move very fast at relativistic speeds. Uh, and uh, and uh, so they are going to essentially try to destroy themselves as fast as possible. And this is only limited by causality because uh, at a given time in the history of the universe, uh, a string can only move uh, a size which is, uh, uh, yeah, a, a size which is related to this, uh, to this, uh, to the size of the horizon. So the best that they can do is, uh, it's not enough to avoid having a, a typical length inside of a Hubble volume that is of the size of the Hubble volume itself, right? <clears throat> so the typic we typically we expect to have a string length. Per causal volume of the order of the causal volume, sorry, causal length divided by causal volume uh, cube. And uh, if you just take, uh, and this is what we'll be observing simulations models. And if you take this expression, we calculate the energy density that we have in cosmic strings. It's just very easy. We just multiply the length by the energy per unit length. Uh, and then we get uh, an expression that is the axon decay constant squared multiplied by Hubble squared and this log that comes from the, um, the tension that now we can assume that is regulated by the presence of the string that is next to our string, right? So each string uh, has a gradient that extends until the next string. Yeah. So already you see that this is, uh, that this is larger than the energy density that I wrote here uh, in, uh, oh, no, not, not really, in the next slide. Yeah, so if you calc if you put the misalignment contribution at T1, you can express it uh, as FA squared, H1 squared, right? Because uh, H1, so the, the axon mass is equal to H1 and the uh, axion, so the, and the energy density in the string, the, uh, in the string network is uh, at T1 is of the, or is expected to be FA H1 squared multiplied by the log and multiplied by the amount of a string length uh, that you have per causal vo uh, volume which turns out not to be a constant, exact constant, but it actually looks like it's increasing uh, in time, only logarithmically. But nevertheless, uh, this gives you a log squared uh, uh, enhancement. So the amount of energy that we have in, in, the, in the string network, so in the gradients of the axon field is much larger than the energy density in the axons that are going to produce the dark matter. So one, obviously, one, one thinks that per perhaps the energy that is going to come up from the destruction of this network can actually, if we put it, if we convert it into axion waves, it can contribute more than the misalignment, right? Uh, however, <clears throat> so, and, and, and this is the name of the game. So how, how does the energy of the network convert into axion waves? Um, well, the axion, number so the uh, the action energy is, is not is actually not the important quantity here because uh at the end what we what what is conserved by, by the expansion of the universe what it matters for the dark matter abundance is the action number not the energy so if, if the actions uh, if the strings uh, while processing the network release a lot of energy but this energy it consists on very high frequency actions right you, all this energy is, con is uh, converted into a few high energy axions. And then when the universe redshifts and so on, the momentum uh, will, will lose uh, its energy and you will only have a few quanta, okay? 
Uh, on the other hand, if the network produces a, a lot of low frequency axions, right, with the same energy, then you can have, well, the, the, there's not so much energy to be red shifted in momentum. All the energy converts into the mass if you want. And so uh, you can have a lot of axions, right? So the important thing is to understand how uh, the network of strings radiates uh, axions. And the quantity to be determined here is uh, what we call the differential uh, energy uh, transfer rate. So how, um, how does the energy of the strings convert into axions as a function of the frequency of the axion or the, what is here, uh, the momentum of the axion, okay? And uh, <clears throat> typically we expect, because this is a, we, we don't have any scale in the problem except for the, uh, the ax this axion mass, which is the, the core size, this, and uh, we have the uh, Hubble. So we expect to have something like a power law. Uh, so th that axons will be emitted in a power law with two cutoffs, Hubble and, uh, uh, and the core size, okay? And um, depending on the power law of this cutoff, we can have two options. If Q is much larger than one, this means that most of these accents are going to be infrared. And we are going to be in the case in which most of the energy is very efficiently converted into action number. And therefore we can have a lot of, uh, we can have a huge enhancement of the action dark matter density. On the other hand, if Q is smaller than one, most of the energy is converted into radiation and few action, few actions, okay? And therefore we will have we, will, we don't expect to have an enhancement of the axon dark matter density over the misalignment scenario. So we can study uh, the value of Q or the, this differential uh, energy transfer rate with numerical simulations. And this is what it has been done uh, for uh, decades already. Uh, and uh, this has been uh, a very active field of research in the last few years. And here uh, we have at least uh, two experts in the audience. One of them, in principle, is the, your uh, humble lecturer. So, uh, the other one is your other humble lecture, uh, not or less, less humble lecture. <laughs> uh, so, um, so these simulations we do uh, in in Cartesian grids up to uh, ten thousand uh, ten thousand points per uh, per lattice site uh, per, per dimension, and what we do is just uh, we run the simulations of complex scalar fields. Uh, we calculate the action spectrum at different times, and then we calculate the time derivative. Uh, so here you have a simulation of how uh, of the string network, where you see the energy density projected along one one direction, and here you have the spectrum uh, of the action. Uh, and you see how well in this case I have fixed the the saxon or the radial mass to be this quantity all the time, uh, and what you see here is that as the time passes. Uh, the axons get destroyed. The coherence length of, of Hubble, Hubble radius increases, uh, and uh, this infrared cutoff moves to smaller and smaller co-moving uh, frequencies. Uh, right. So this is the the infrared cutoff moving down as uh, the strings destroyed and and radiate. And you see uh, very interesting processes here. You see. Uh, loops collapsing you see uh, strings intersecting and you see waves uh, front uh, wave fronts that are produced from these reconnections and so on and these waves in the action field are just relativistic accents very good so this is a typical simulation and what are the uh, results so the results on q are summarized in this plot uh, produced by uh, kenichi saikawa uh, my collaborator and you see the value of Q that has been uh, calculated by uh, three uh, co uh, collaborate three very recent works. Uh, the, the oldest and perhaps uh, I don't know the best <laughs> was was put up by uh, by Gorghetto, uh, Biladoro et al. Um, very recently, and there they calculated uh, uh, with grids up to four thousand the value of Q. Uh, with a, a great attention to detail, and they show that actually the so this is the the, the results in gray. They showed that this uh, is very close to one, but is increasing. And the best fit to this trend is uh, that is a, a straight line. Um, so they concluded that um, well, not only that, but they concluded that this is exactly what one expects. Uh, 
And therefore, they conclude that Q will go to uh, values larger than one if we are able to uh, simulate uh, with better resolution, which means um, larger values of the log. Uh, this value of the log is, uh, is the key in all these simulations is the log of the radial mass divided by Hubble. And because Hubble is decreasing with time, is in, is, uh, this value of the log is increasing in the simulations. So this is the, the last snapshot of the simulation. This is uh, in the middle, more or less. Uh, so this is what was found by Gorgetto et al. This was a, a surprise. Um, then a little bit later, Bushman et al., the, the, the American group, they did a, um, one simulation, one fantastic simulation using adaptive mesh refinement to increase uh, the, the, the value of the log and um, to, uh, to have the strings resolved with very good accuracy. So this is what they wanted, but they did just one simulation and they came up with this uh, black data uh, in which they, from which they concluded that actually the best fit to the data is a straight line, okay? And they concluded that actually Q is very similar uh, to one. With one simulation <clears throat> that had uh, different parameters and they didn't offer any comparison with the previous data. So they say, okay, this is what we get. And this is the extrapolation. We don't know why it's different. Um, so we were all left with a very uh, bitter taste in the mouth. Uh, uh, so, um, oh yes, this log is 70, sorry. The physical, the physical point is 70. So if you take, uh, but this you, you know already. You know, uh, what, what is the value of H1, right? H1 uh, at uh, the QCD phase transition is of the order of one nanoelectron volt. So 10 to the minus nine electron volt. And this, uh, this can be, uh, so the radial mass can have a value of order FA. So if you take something like 10 to the 10 GeV, so this is 10 to the 19 GeV electron volt. So you get something like 10 to the 30, uh, and you take the log of 10 to 30, you get something like 60, 60, 70. So another factor of uh, six of all. Uh, so yeah, so then uh, for many years, even before uh, uh, this paper was published, we were working on the same. And uh, now we have our results um, with uh, Kenichi Saikawa. And we actually, uh, we tried to, to make a, to, to study with a lot of care also the same system and we reached conclusions which are very similar to uh, Gorgetto et al. Uh, so the, X, the, the value of Q is increasing and actually we, we were able to, uh, or we will uh, um, a bit more dashful and uh, go to larger uh, boxes and, and we dare to, to take uh, um, data where perhaps we shouldn't have and uh, and we observed actually that Q is, is, is going above, uh, above one if we use the same methods than the previous people. And also we, uh, in this study, we have some understanding of why these two results can be uh, slightly different, but I'm not going to enter into details. Uh, we have another method that is completely different and agrees very well with the previous first method, but uh, doesn't agree at late times. We still have not understand this very well, but it looks like this second method would just give a constant value. But uh, we don't understand we don't understand whether this is justified or not. So this will be published soon. This, uh, so the Bushman and uh, these ones, mm -hmm. yeah, they're not exactly the same, and they are, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, yeah. So the the simulations are not exactly the same. Uh, so we are not we are not claiming that this has to be exactly the same. For instance, uh, discretization of the Laplacian is slightly different, and our definition of the attractor uh, is slightly different. Uh, so one expects uh, here that there can be some differences. Here uh, there shouldn't be less, and there are less. So this uh, we are we are very happy that the convergence is relatively good here. But these are only certain. So this is only statistical errors and and some fit errors, right? 
uh, I think with, with this 11,000 cubes is of the order of uh, 15 or so. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not zero, but uh, you have many more, right? You, you have of the order of 100. Yeah. Mm. No, no, so this this is a this is a reasonable set at least in this in the in the region where is uh, where we are together. So the errors might be comparable, um, but the semantics are slightly different. So I'm, I, here I'm, we are not surprised at the moment uh, of this. Yep. Yeah, this method is, is to be taken with a grain of salt. We can talk about this when, when we discuss action cosmology instead of the lecture, because uh, otherwise we will not finish, yeah? This, ex this simulation is extremely expensive. Uh, yeah. So in principle, adaptive mesh refinement has to be a tool that allows you to do a very resolved simulation with a, a limited amount of RAM. But this only works if you, if you use, uh, if, if you tune your adaptive mesh refinement technique uh, very finely. And here, they didn't write their own code. They used the uh, AMRX library, so a library, uh, and they adapted it very cleverly and very good. But nevertheless, uh, so this library is not optimized for strings. It's optimized for small, small objects, uh, one uh, zero dimensional objects. and. Uh, so I'm not surprised that this, I mean, nevertheless, they went until here, right? So they, they went much farther away and they resolved uh, the strings better than we do. So they, they, they were a little bit more um, careful about this. So they, they could have gone, they would have showed points here, I think. Yeah, so this is all very exciting. And we will have, a, a, you will have another dose of uh, cosmic strings in my lecture on, on, on my talk of the 5th of, of, of May. Um, so if we extrapolate this, these results, these values of Q to the physical point, which is something like 70. If Q is more than one, no, the, the amount of axions compared to, to the misalignment value is negligible. Uh, if Q is of, of, of the order of one, then you get a, a comparable uh, value, slightly larger than misalignment. Uh, and, but if Q uh, has this linear trend and this trend continues, then Q becomes larger than one. And once it becomes larger than one, the, the amount of actions produced uh, is quite significantly above uh, the misalignment value, which is oh, yeah, so around the four to one. So unfortunately, until we, we, we are not uh, very sure of this extrapolation, we will not have a prediction for the amount of actions radiated from strings, but it looks like it all, all, it's all pointing more or less to this, uh, to this direction at the moment. Um, one can ask, so when we have, once we have this result, what is the axion mass for which we will have all the dark matter abundance uh, in axions? And, and until this uh, um, discrepancy is not resolved, we will have some variance in the final mass. But you can say that if Q is uh, of order one, uh, then you should have um, <clears throat> of the order of 100 microelectron volts. And uh, if Q is much larger than one, the action, so the, so many actions are produced that you have to increase slightly the mass at least to 500 uh, microelectron volt, uh, so 0.5 uh, millielectron volt to produce, so to have the observed value and not overproduced. Very good. Mm. <clears throat> so this was uh, how the network behaves in the scalar regime and how many actions are produced from uh, the. Uh, dynamics of this string. I have uh, five minutes, so I have to be very fast. But uh, nowadays, we shouldn't have any of these strings in the universe. What happens to them is that at, um, at the QCD phase transition, uh, the QCD potential lifts up membranes on the string loops, membranes that have energy density related to the QCD phase transition, uh, because they are the regions that have theta equals or around pi. Because this, the, the global strings, they all touch, they touch all the values of theta from zero to two pi. They always have, they, all, they are always attached to a region where theta is equal to pi. And uh, QCD energy is larger when theta is equal to pi. So when this QCD energy is very high. Yeah. 
but well, maybe I need uh, one hour. <clears throat> so I have to be fast. So uh, domain walls lift up and have a lot of energy. And uh, if you have a look, so one can very easily estimate the energy per unit area of a domain wall. If you just take the topological susceptibility is the energy density in regions of theta equals pi, multiplied by the area, and then the thickness of the string, which is the inverse of the action mass. Uh, you can, uh, this comes from a minimization uh, argument that I can reproduce if you are interested. So the energy per unit area, essentially the action mass multiplied by FA squared, and the energy of all the domain walls that form uh, in all the loops attached to the strings is uh, MA um, FA squared multiplied by H. So this is, uh, different than the typical string uh, network energy, which is H squared FA squared. So <clears throat> if you wait enough time, MA is increasing with time and H is decreasing. So the ratio between the energy in the main walls and the strings is increasing like MA divided by H. And at some point when this equation is satisfied, which doesn't, have, doesn't happen very late with respect to T1, uh, the energy in the domain walls is larger than the energy in the strings, which means that the, the dynamics of the string network is now is going to be dominated by the dynamics of the walls. And the walls, they want to do the same than the strings. Uh, they, want to, they want to minimize the energy density, uh, but the, the walls, they have a purpose. The strings, they don't have a preferred direction because oh, at, at the beginning, they didn't have a strong uh, preferred direction. A loop can close onto any value of theta, right? If it's a loop, it will close. But the walls are going to always pull in the direction of theta equals zero. And therefore, are able to destroy all the strings essentially in one Hubble time, right? Because the distance between strings is typically the causal horizon. And there's always a, there's always a wall attached to any string. And the, the typical distance of this wall is the, cause, is the Hubble distance. So this wall will pull any string, even infinitely long strings, right? They have, they always, they have strings around and they have domain walls to attach to other strings. So they will be pulled and destroyed. So if you want, imagine a huge string of the size of the whole universe, right? It has a huge domain wall, but this string is, has closed loops around and these closed loops so they have, this string has domain walls to these small uh, loops, no? these small strings. And now the way that uh, these huge strings be destroyed is not by destroying, it's not by collapsing this huge loop will take forever. No, these small loops are going to dig holes in the, in the, in the large membrane that are going to open up, right? So the, the whole membrane will destroy it from the inside out. So, Domain walls produce the destruction of, of the network. Uh, and I wanted to show you some movies, um, but we don't have a lot of time. Ah, sorry, I should have put the movie while I was showing this. So let me just accelerate a bit. And uh, what you see here is that uh, in all my simulation, the actions are going to, the, to more or less t equals zero, but uh, with some oscillations around zero, and the domain walls are pulling out the remaining strings uh, to oblivion. So in this scenario, uh, everything is as we, as we hope, and there's no domain walls, and there's no cosmic strings after T1. <clears throat> Here I have to talk about uh, the so-called domain wall problem. Everything I've said applies only for n equals one. So if uh, my KSBC uh, model has only one extra quark, what happens if I put more than one quark is that now uh, I have to sum over uh, quarks in my Lagrangian. And when I compute the low energy effective theory, now I have N quarks that run in the loop. And therefore my uh, GG tilde uh, gets multiplied not by the action field divided by FA and that's it, but gets an extra piece of N that you know already from, uh, from um, previous lectures, right? But now remember that I have, I have defined my FA in, in a slightly, well, in, in a very clear way. Uh, 
I've defined FA in such a way that the field of a complex, sorry, the angle of a complex scalar field is theta is accent divided by FA. So this means that by definition, because a complex scalar field has physical has only physical values of the angle between zero and two pi, right? And and if you go to four pi is so zero is equal to two pi and four pi is the same point in this physical space. So this the way I've defined theta has a periodicity from zero to two pi. But now my GG tilde gets multiplied by this accent divided by FA multiplied by N. So this means that while this accent divided by FA moves from zero to two pi, it's going to wrap up in the QCD potential N times. So this action field is going to experience the QCD potential N times and not only one, which is what I uh, uh, wrote here. So the picture is such that now if we go from minus pi FA to pi FA, or from theta minus pi to pi, uh, I'm wrapping, so I'm going around the QCD potential several times. Uh, for instance, in this n equals three case, <clears throat> this is what we get. And this means that I'm going to have more than one uh, vacuum that preserves CP violation uh, and that minimizes the energy. Uh, in this case, I get uh, three. So for each value of, of n, I get one uh, extra value, which is physically different from the rest, right? Okay, and now all these values are going to be populated after the phase transition because I said theta, so the QCD potential is irrelevant at very high energies, right? Uh, so theta goes from minus pi to pi randomly. Very good. Now what is going to happen is that uh, my universe is going to, so when, when, uh, when the QCD potential becomes very big, my cosmic strings around which uh, the axion wraps from zero to two pi, are going to have uh, n domain walls attached, not one. So we have uh, one domain wall at theta, for instance, in this case, at theta equals to uh, pi thirds, and another one attached to uh, two pi, oh, sorry, uh, two pi thirds, no, um, pi thirds uh, pi, right? And uh, minus pi thirds. So now the domain walls are going to pull this string in three directions and there's no preferred direction. So there's no preferred direction. And this, if you want another way of, of looking at this is that now my accent field is, ha is having three different vacua and there's no preferred vacua. So, so there are going to be regions in the universe that have that settled to one vacuum and other regions that settle in the other. And there's no way of distinguishing them. So st statistically, they are going to be populating the same with the same faction. And this is a disaster because in between this vacuum, we have a, do a domain wall now, right? And uh, since there's no way of destroying the domain walls, the, uh, so these domain walls are going to be there with us forever. I had some movies, but I have no time. Um, so let me just uh, recall that the density in domain walls was of the order of MA times H than FA. And if I don't destroy them now, they're going to stay with me forever. But the density of the domain walls and radiation domination decreases like one over T, which is this uh, Hubble constant, which goes like one over R squared. And this uh, red shifts much, much slower than the energy density in radiation or that the energy density in matter. And the same happens in matter domination. The dom density of domain walls will be one over T, which red shifts much faster, sorry, much slower than the matter density. So this means that the network of domain walls is going to end up dominating the universe. And you can calculate with the parameters of the QCD that this domination happens before today. So the prediction of this n larger than one scenario is that we will have now one domain wall of the size of the universe, okay, in the middle of our universe, and it will dominate by far the energy density of the universe. Since we don't observe anything like that, we have to rule out completely this scenario. There's nothing in our universe that looks like this scenario at all. And so this kills uh, a lot of 
models in the post-inflation scenario. There are some solutions which involve uh, actually breaking explicitly the Pacheco symmetry, so that now all the different vacua are slightly have slightly different energy densities, and this will make one of them the lowest energy density, and then the regions that are in the uh, slightly lifted uh, vacuum energy regions will feel a pressure, right? And uh, they will shrink compared to the others, uh, to, compared to the real vacuum. So the domain walls will feel a pressure from the real vacuum and they will go eventually in the right direction and they will collapse all uh, in this vacuum. However, in the, so in these scenarios, we have to destroy, we have to break the Pacheco symmetry, right? Typically. Uh, and this in uh, this is a very strongly constrained. Um, uh, so you have to introduce this new term in the potential that could come, as, as Giovanni already pointed out, this could come naturally from uh, quantum gravity corrections or from some other uh, corrections to the uh, Pacheco symmetry or the Pacheco theory that actually break the global symmetry. Uh, so, so to some extent, this degeneracy breaking is expected. So this is uh, the good news. But unfortunately, uh, the, it's, it's, the the numbers that one has to put to this parameter are not all the, uh, very satisfactory from the um, uh, theoretical point of view. And it's very easy to end up uh, destroying the solution of the strong CP problem, for instance. If, you, uh, if you're curious, uh, just tell, uh, ask me more about it. So I'm using this uh, extra five minutes uh, to to very 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 uh, very briefly say two things about mini clusters. So um, so in this scenario, uh, the axions uh, after T1 or T2, when the the, the 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 domain walls are able to destroy all the cosmic strings. Uh, the axioms are already extremely non-relativistic because they were always uh, very non-relativistic. So they were oh, they, they had typical momenta of the order of Hubble. Uh, but now after the axion mass turns in, uh, the axion mass is increasing very fast, right? So they become even cooled by the fact that topological susceptibility is increasing and it increases by almost four orders of magnitude. Uh, so they, be, they become ultra cooled, and then this means that they, they, they freeze essentially. So the, the accents, they cannot move very far after uh, becoming non relativistic. Uh, so, what we observed in the simulations is that um, there are some non linearities happening in very high, the, uh, high density regions that lead to the appearance of uh, what we call accidents. And these are uh, um, essentially a result of the fact that the action has attractive self interactions so actions like to be uh, together because of the cosine potential and uh, they want to be together very str so strongly that they uh, create uh, so they collapse so they, they collapse in clumps and these clumps uh, cannot be held together and they explode later so this is the phenomenon called this is a universal phenomenon in self attractive self interacting attractive uh, scalar fields that is called the bossa nova behavior, and we observe it here, uh, although we cannot uh, study it in detail. But after that, after these bossa novas have exploded, these accidents have exploded, the action field freezes out, and what we see is a frozen density field with some uh, funny uh, marks uh, and a correlation length, which is of the order of L1. The L1 that I've told you that is of the order of uh, 30 milliparsecs. So. And uh, <clears throat> The universe is order one inhomogeneous, isn't because the difference in, in the values of theta are of order one and the, the density, the, the difference in density of different regions is of order one. Uh, the density inhomogeneities are of order one. And if you look at the gravitational collapse of a spherical uh, spherical object uh, in the universe, uh, so for instance, uh, studied by uh, Colby Turner in the in the case of a universe dominated by radiation and matter, uh, you find that if, if you have a region that has a density which is uh, above the density of dark matter by a factor of phi, okay, the density of this object here is uh, one plus phi over density, then uh, the, <clears throat> the departure from the Hubble flow 
is essentially always uh, to, to very good precision controlled by the value of this phi here. Uh, and uh, essentially you can calculate very easily that the, the, this object is going to collapse at the redshift that is the redshift of equality multiplied by phi. Okay, so if this phi is of order one, this object will collapse at uh, quality. But if you have a, a region that is 10 times denser, uh, matter, if you want, you can think that matter equality, so a matter radiation equality will happen in this object uh, a factor of 10 times earlier, and then it will uh, collapse even earlier, right? So, uh, and these objects uh, actually collapse uh, earlier than matter radiation equality. You can estimate very easily what is going to be the virialized radius, which is essentially the typical size of uh, my inhomogeneity uh, divided by the uh, redshift of collapse, because once an object collapses gravitationally, uh, it doesn't expand. It, does, it, it decouples from the Hubble flow, right? So we have <clears throat> these regions, uh, regions where axions are slightly over, so the density of axions is slightly over dense, and after T1 are expanding, but then at some point, very close to matter radiation, they realize that they have enough matter to form a halo, to, to be gravitationally bound, right? And then they form this halo, which decouples from the Hubble flow. And this beer, the, 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 the typical radius is going to be the radius when the collapse takes place. And one can also calculate the, uh, the density of the final halo, which is of the order of the density of, uh, of the matter inequality multiplied by these parameters phi that characterize my over density. This density, uh, the typical density is 10 to the six GB per cubic centimeter. That's the density of dark matter at the moment of matter radiation equality. This is in general, right? So this is a general statement. Now these mini clusters, <clears throat> if they are able to keep this density, um, they're going to, and they survive until today, they're, they're going, to be, going to be denser uh, than the local dark matter density that we have here around the earth by a factor of 10 to the five, 10 to the six, right? Because the density, of, well, even more than 10 to, this, 10 to the seven, because the typical density of dark matter that we expect here in the galaxy on average in our position is 0.3 or 0.5 GeV per cubic centimeter. So these objects are 10 to the six, 10 to the seven times denser than the average density that they expect here today. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have done um, numerical simulations of the formation of these uh, of these halos. Um, and here you have one, for instance. Where here you see the, the you don't see the redshift, but now we are getting uh, twenty thousand, fifteen thousand, eleven thousand, and now it's more or less matter radiation equality, and you see that already these objects have already collapsed, uh, and this is. Uh, now the CMB was released more or less at this redshift of 8,000 well, a little bit earlier. And already the universe looks like completely uh, uh, evolved in, in um, gravitationally, right? So you see the typical features of uh, cold dark matter. Uh, you see halos and filament connected by filaments. So this is exactly the same, but the, but the scales at which this is happening are milliparsec, moving milliparsec, okay? And... Um, so the, we have calculated from, uh, with these numerical simulations, the abundance of these halos uh, and the typical mass, which turns out to be uh, what was predicted, uh, same with the, the order of 10 to the minus 12 at matter radiation equality. Uh, and of course, when we go to um, smaller red shifts, uh, more halos uh, form, right? By, by, by merging, uh, of smaller mini clusters. So we have some idea of how many of these objects are. And what is mo most important, uh, we know how much of the dark matter is inside of these halos, right? So of all the dark matter of the universe, we can see that uh, around 80% of the dark matter will be inside of these objects. And this is an extremely disappointing factor for experimentalists that want to search for actions in this scenario because uh, the probability that we cross one of these objects is very small. Uh, will happen once in every 10 to the four years or five years or so. Therefore, this means that we have to be content with the average density in between mini clusters. Uh, and uh, we know that this can only be 
uh, much smaller because only 20% of the energy is outside of these many clusters. And this is the, in, this is the integral. Yeah. Is the integral of, of the, uh, yeah, it's dominated by the largest masses, you're right. Uh, 10 to the, yeah. Ten, yeah, exactly. Hmm. Exactly. And uh, well, we have, so people have uh, studied also the probability that these objects will survive. And uh, it turns out that uh, the, the, the biggest threat for these objects, once they have formed, is that they pass very close uh, to a star in our galaxy. If this happens, they will be destroyed completely by tidal forces. But the probability for the mini clusters that are around us is relatively small. For values of theta of order one, the probability is of the order one percent or so. So these objects, for, as, as far as we know, they will survive. Uh, so we have to, we have to, for direct detection, we have we are left to what density we have in between mini clusters. And in a recent paper that uh, I think will also be discussed in, in the conference, we, uh, we found that <clears throat> very interestingly, the average density in voids also gets to a, a more or less stable value that doesn't go to zero uh, as in the spherical uh, case. But in our simulations, we find actually that uh, the average density in voids stabilizes to a value which is around uh, five to eight percent. So there's uh, it's bad news, but it's not as bad as, as one could get. And um, just to finish, I just wanted to say that uh, in this scenario, we have this very nice prediction that at very small scales, um, scales which are much smaller than any cosmological scale, the dark matter is made of uh, these uh, mini halos, right? And what could, what could uh, ask, so, can we observe these mini halos in some way? One possibility would, we would be doing uh, micro lensing because actually the, the Subaru Hyper Supreme camera uh, experiment uh, already searched for uh, um, objects of that of the typical mass of 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11 solar masses uh, in the form of primordial black holes and was able to exclude uh, dark matter forming uh, so that the dark matter is primarily made of these uh, objects. Uh, however, uh, mini clusters are not as compact as primordial black holes. They are bigger and the, the microlessing signal uh, is much, much, um, much weaker. Uh, so in a, in a recent study, we also found that only under the most extreme assumptions for a mini cluster uh, core, we could have microlensing and only for masses which are above one milli electron volt. So it's just, it doesn't seem uh, we're going to have uh, a lot of uh, microlensing events from axon mini clusters. And finally, I just wanted to mention that this is not the only way of dis discovering these mini clusters. We, there are all the types of lensing that one can study, femtolensing, that could be a possibility in the future. Uh, we could have, as already mentioned, um, axon dark matter mini clusters encountering with neutron stars and producing a burst of photons that we could detect. Uh, we could have some mini clusters going through the Earth. Uh, and uh, ramping up or giving a, a huge boost in the in the detection um, for, um, post, uh, in the detection signal, uh, we can have mini clusters, or we can have the tidal streams of mini clusters in the galaxy, given uh, uh, enhancement, and this has to be studied in more detail. Uh, and uh, we can have in these mini clusters the formation of bosonovas uh, that of these instabilities that I told you before that could uh, lead to some production of photons that we could identify. So there's the list uh, continues, um, but, uh, but not much longer. And uh, I think there are plenty of possibilities for studying, for, for studying the phenomenology of, the, of these mini clusters. And if we are able to uh, find these mini clusters would be a huge, uh, huge thing because we would pinpoint not only the existence of something like an action, but also a type, a type of cosmology. And we would have a handle on, uh, on, uh, on what, uh, what scale inflation could have happened, something like this, right? So discovery uh, of any of these signals would have very profound implications, uh, not only for particle physics, but also for cosmology. And I should close it here, right? Sorry for the. Um...
compatible with what we know about structure formation, biological manipulation. Because these objects are one and another unit all the time. And so exactly. So this uh, all the all the fun happens at so small scales that we cannot we don't have gravitational proofs of dark matter at those small scales. So all the evidences of dark matter that we have and all the measurements happen at much larger scales, which contain so many mini clusters that are that the effect are averaged out. Um, yes. Sorry, off. Uh, I think we have a we have a postdoc here in in, um, in the house that is precisely uh, uh, advancing a little bit on on this uh, along these lines. Is, uh, Ragu, have you met him, Ragu? I just only realized yesterday. So I know that Jordi uh, Miralda and and, com and companies of uh, people from Princeton they put a, a, a paper that was, has some follow ups and looks somehow promising, uh, but uh, the numbers have not been done. But uh, Ragu is, is actually finishing a paper on that, so we can we can speak about. Uh, I, I was hoping to have some info uh, with with you, right? So we will have some, uh, I think, some news very soon, or at least in the coffee break. <laughs> Um, so it was something like 10 to the four years or five. Hmm. So what, what are the implications for MadMax? So the implications for MadMax are, so, so to the best of my current knowledge now is that we, when we look for, so we have to, uh, we have to reduce the density of dark matter that we are assuming yeah. by a factor of uh, ten, uh, twenty or twenty. Of 20. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> and we have to wait a little bit more because um, we have not. So um, we have taken the results before galaxy formation. So now we know that many of the mini clusters are going to uh, be disrupted in the galaxy. And they can they can increase the signal. So we have not studied this properly yet. So, not don't get too uh, too yeah. pessimistic. I, I, this is the worst that uh, it, this is the worst that can happen in our opinion at the moment. This is not so for the main more number does help you. So what are the what are the properties of mini clusters in a in a very the main more number large? So this has not. This has not been studied in, in great detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so uh, there are two possibilities. Either nothing changes very much, <clears throat> or if you insist in having a, a very large axial mass, uh, it might happen that mini clusters become uh, much, much bigger. And then, uh, and then it could, you could have uh, perhaps some, um, some extra, some some micro lensing perhaps. Okay, um, okay I think we should uh, close now. Yeah. yeah. Wants to go back. Or?